This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, yes, indeed, the show that will have you saying afterwards, you know, I learned something new today. At least that's our goal anyway. Hi again, folks. Welcome to another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Kenny Bergamy. Ray D'Alessio is off this week. Now, straight ahead on the program, family food and great discussions at this year's annual Young Farmers Conference in Jekyll Island. Uh, Georgia Farm Bureau calls this the organization's most important event of the year. Also on the show, from humble beginnings to one farmer's dream of seeing athletes become regulars on award podiums across the state, nation, and the world. And then later. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick. If you're like me and you like a fresh salad and maybe a little fish on the side, stick around. We're going to show you how to grow that salad and those fish in an area the size of maybe your kitchen table. It all starts right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. And we began in Jekyll Island, where recently the Georgia Farm Bureau hosted its annual Young Farmer Leadership Conference. As Damon Jones explains, the four days of activities combined the perfect blend of business and family. Each and every year, there's plenty of food, fun, and fellowship on Jekyll Island as the Georgia Farm Bureau puts on their Young Farmer Leadership Conference. It's a chance to shine the spotlight on an organization that is essential to the future of the agricultural industry because it develops the next leaders of our organization. It develops the next leaders in agribusiness, in farming councils and such uh, around the country. And, and um, it, it's an opportunity to hone skills, uh, communication skills and, and leadership skills that wouldn't be uh, taken advantage of anyplace else. One of the main messages from this year's conference is putting those communication skills to good use by spreading the story of agriculture to the public. When you're dealing with agricultural groups, there's so many times that people just think, you know what, I'm just a farmer, I'm just a rancher. And at the same time, you have such an ability, you have such an amazing story that you could actually get out there and tell. And I want to inspire people to get out there and tell their story. And there is no better group than this collection of young farmers to tell that story, as their passion for the industry will resonate with those listening. It's the kind of power that many don't know they have. People will listen to people when they're young. These guys, these guys and gals really probably don't even know the full impact they can have with their voice. When a congressional leader, when a, when a news reporter, when someone in, in a big city hears a young person talking about why they do what they do, but more importantly, why it matters to that person, there's great power in that voice. There's great ability. This generation also has a great ability to make changes in the political realm as well as their willingness to get involved has a major impact on lawmakers both state and nationwide. Millennials are important to the, to the political process because we know they care about change. We know they care about making a difference. We know they care about being involved in what that difference looks like. Uh, they share several different key, uh, values of, that are different than other generations that makes them unique to be able to, uh, to drive change within this election, to drive change in this country, drive change in their state. While there was plenty of information to be had in these sessions, it wasn't all business, as these farmers also got a chance to spend plenty of time with their family while also catching up with friends. Well, now, and then friends and family and having the opportunity to take the kids to the beach and do things like that makes Jekyll Island a pretty special place to hold an event like this. And, and sh for sure, we have folks that we've known since college and such to be able to reconnect and, and make sure that we keep friendships, friendships strong for the future. And the highlight of the conference is always handing out the state awards. Each winner not only received a cash prize, but an ATV as well. And the winners this year were Sky Guest from Oconee County, who won the Young Farmer Discussion Meet. Jonathan and Bridget Hitchcock of Washington County won the Young Farmer Achievement Award. And Bennett and Rebecca James of Polk County took home the Excellence in Ag Award. And that's, that's the, what we're trying to do as an organization is promote uh, farmers that strive to be the best at what they do, to be efficient, to be creating a product that consumers can depend on and trust in. And uh, I think that's just a little incentive. Reporting from Jekyll Island, I am Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Damon, thank you very much. Now, summertime, of course, means lots of food, fun, and the great outdoors. And this time of year, it could also mean picking up those unwanted, annoying little creatures known as ticks. However, UGA professor of entomology, Dr. Nancy Hinkle, says while it's important to be cautious of their presence, 
We shouldn't be afraid of them. According to Hinkle, most ticks are not infected and can only transmit diseases during certain times of the year. This time of year, spring and summer, and most of the fall, the most common tick you're going to find on yourself or on your dog is the Lone Star Tick. This is the one that everyone can recognize because she has a white dot right in the middle of her back. The great thing is here in the southeast, you cannot get Lyme disease from a tick in the summer. Since the Lyme disease carrier is a winter tick, the deer tick, that's the time of year when people are most likely to encounter the deer tick. Meanwhile in Moultrie, the fields at Sunbelt Ag Expo were open for all to see as the public got an opportunity to not only witness how the crops are looking, but to hear about some of the latest techniques and technologies that keep Georgia agriculture growing. The Monitor's Mark Wildman was there and has the story. It was a typical middle of July day in South Georgia, clear sky and hot, but that didn't stop a large crowd from gathering at the Darrell Williams Research Farm to hear about all of the latest advancements that keep Georgia and American agriculture great. The Sunbelt Ag Expo is North America's premier farm show and, and uh, our summer field day is a chance for us to, to put on an, an educational day. Uh, we, mesh, um, we mesh educational and research and, and company and, and industry together uh, and, and this day is to, a day where we can bring our farmers out, we can bring our growers out, we can bring our consultants out uh, and, and everybody can get uh, the answers that they want. Uh, that's, people ask, well, well, what do I need to come looking for? What's the new thing? Well, well I want to be able to provide the information that the farmer needs to hear. Uh, I want to I wanna bring the people here that know about the, the issues of today uh, and, and I want to bring the farmers in and, and let them ask the questions and get the information that, that they need to make their operations successful. UGA Extension Cotton Agronomist Jared Whitaker was at the field day. He was able to share some very important information about a very important Georgia crop. We're talking about the stuff we're doing here as far as research. Um, you know, I work here, I've been here working here for several years with cotton and soybeans uh, in my past. Uh, responsibilities but with cotton we're looking at cotton varieties and how these varieties respond to PGRs and management and that kind of thing so um, we, we appreciate the opportunity to work here and work with these guys they give us a good chance to have large plot work and, and do uh, different research projects that we're interested in and basically kind of give us another site to do work um, you know in a different environment other than in Tifton and our other coastal plain experiment stations. Not only was he able to share information about research, but he was also able to educate the crowd on just how well the crop is doing statewide this growing season. All in all, our dry land crop looks pretty good. The irrigator looks even better. Um, we do need a rain. I mean, we always do. And, you know, in Georgia, we're lucky enough to have a lot of irrigation, but we're always a few days away from a drought. Um, but other than the fact that we need a little bit of rain, we're probably in pretty good shape. And, you know, yields could be, you know, I've always said August is usually the month that matters the most, and we're getting close to August. If we get good rainfall and good conditions in August, we do pretty well. So we're still ready for it. The field day may be an event for farmers to look forward to, but, of course, the main attraction here is in the fall of the year. The Sunbelt Expo puts Moultrie on the map. Uh, it's a big deal for us here in, here in Cockle County. It's a big deal for the southeastern United States as well as the, the, um, the whole United States because we're able, to, we're able to do that research and we're able to do this education and demonstration uh, and, and this work in farm is really what sets it apart. So as field day participants view peanuts, soybeans, corn, and other crops growing in the fields, they can take comfort in knowing all of the different varieties and technology on display here are aimed at helping the farmer stay profitable and more efficient. Reporting from Moultrie, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Up next on the Monitor, with the Summer Olympics just weeks away, how this world-class training facility for divers started from the vision of a Georgia cotton farmer. Hey, my name's Robert Dalton. I raise basketball stuff here in Mansfield, Georgia. I started off with uh, cucumbers and squash and all the first things in March. Just as soon as they gone, I pull them up and plant green beans and peas there. Plant eggplants, peppers. I got three different kinds of tomatoes. They Romas and F91s and Red Mornings. And 
I just keep something growing all the time to try to keep it going, bring a dollar in. Me and my wife do most of it, but I have grandkids and great grandkids, they come help me. You know, when times get hard, <laughs> you know, I all, everything comes in at one time. <laughs> Everybody come by and stop and feed Jack. They, they even go to the store and bring Jack something. And I got all these vegetables up here and they come up here and buy stuff just to go back and feed Jack. He's a loving little old donkey. <laughs> uh, he's been here as long as I am. I reckon on my wife. She got, she got Jack for her birthday. How long ago was this? 15 years ago. My wife, she does all the canning and pickling and stuff. And that's everything from my garden. We don't buy nothing nowhere else or nothing. It's just everything she does comes from the garden, you know. And when whatever she does, cans or pickles or whatever, it's in the season and she does it. As soon as something else comes in, she'll start doing it too, you know. Does it as long as the garden's running, she's running. <laughs> Today we have a somewhat unique story for the Farm Monitor. It's the story of Colquitt County farmer, the late Moose Moss. We got a look at Moss's incredible legacy that started on his home farm near the community of Moultrie in 1964. You would expect to see these typical sites in and around Colquitt County in Moultrie, Georgia, but not a high diving platform with top-notch diving coaches a world-class facility, uh, dry land included, um, awesome talent, and just an awesome culture to be in. Um, before I came down here, I was at Ohio State University. I was uh, one of the club coaches up there. Um, and from the moment I stepped on this campus uh, during my interview, I just said I had to be here. Well, just like you, we've asked, how did this facility find its way to Moultrie, Georgia? This pool was built out of a bullpen uh, back in 1964. My mom was interested in putting in a pool because we had four kids in four years and those four kids were all interested in gymnastics and eventually got interested in diving. So it just kind of made sense to put in a pool and uh, mom said put in a pool and Moose put in the pool. I mean, it's absolutely incredible, uh, just his determination and uh, you know his, his story. Um, I think it's his farming background and that, that work ethic um, and to be a farmer, you got to be passionate. You can't just, that's not a profession you just do. You know, and so with that passion, with that work ethic, you know, this is something he was also passionate about. And I think it was that combination uh, that he just, you know, if you build it, they will come. You know, field of dreams. You know, that we, we, we make fun of it. We call it the cement pond. You know, but, um, you know, it's just that, that vision and it's that, that drive that he had, you know, it's just synonymous with, with what the vision is currently still. This is the Moose Moss Aquatic Center. A lot of the kids were not making international teams because we didn't have towers. And they had three events on all international events. So uh, he and a local architect started a design and a plan to uh, put in the Moose Moss Aquatic Center, which is, uh, um, meets every national and international spe specs to compete. These pools and diving boards have turned out some world champions too. Um, just with the culture here, with the amount of support that we have from small businesses in the community, with the talent that we have and we get to work up with and the facility itself. I mean, we are, I mean, I keep saying we're world-class, but so I, I, I mean it genuinely. Um, we're second to none almost in this country, uh, which is not a normal environment for, you know, the average coach. So uh, it, would, it would almost be, you know, foolish for me uh, to leave here unless it was like, I mean, I don't know. It would have to be off the charts on every single category of, of, of uh, you know, what I'm looking for because uh, we have it all. I mean, honestly, we have it all here. Preston Jimerson is Rick Moss's son-in-law. He is the Colquitt County Young Farmer Chair. He now manages the acreage that once belonged to Moose Moss. Historically, we have been a cotton and peanut farm. Uh, before that, there, were, there was uh, obviously tobacco and cows. Since I came back, we've moved into uh, cabbage, pecans, corn, peanuts, and cotton. Uh, but the diving was just a vehicle to teach 
uh, life lessons. And he said that many times he could have done that in baseball or football or any sport. But it was a sport that he got excited about to teach life lessons of work ethic uh, uh, and self-discipline, goal setting. Well, just a reminder, if you missed any part of this story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel. That's the Georgia Farm Monitor. Once there, you can browse the archive of stories dating as far back as 2009. And once you're done watching all those informative stories, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page that we've set up for you. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, feel free to send us a message either on Facebook or the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick coming up next. You know, we talk locally grown all the time, but I'm going to show you another way that you can grow fresh vegetables and fish even in your house. Stick around. A productive garden full of fruits, vegetables, and flowers. But note the location, a street corner near downtown Memphis. That's where you'll find Mike Menace working this hot morning. He grows produce and horticulture as part of the landmark farmer's market. Mike also uses his garden as a teaching tool for area youth. One of our primary objectives is to teach young people how to garden. I think it was the great Frederick Douglass who said that it was easier to build strong children than it is to rebuild broken men. And that's one of our goals is to set children on a path towards healthy living. The Landmark Market is part of the historic Orange Mound neighborhood. Heavily populated, sure, but on just about every street there's usable land in yards and lots. TSU and UT Extension agents work with residents in urban gardening encouraging them to grow healthful foods for the people here. In a lot of our communities here, there is not a grocery store within a four mile radius that they can get fresh produce. So I talk to them about getting things in the community that's, that could serve the community. So that's what I do. Whether you're growing food or flowers, urban gardening adds greenery to a big city like Memphis. Also, downtown gardening reduces stormwater runoff and can even make a place cooler during the hot summer. Just a few miles away, there's the Greenleaf Farm. This used to be a trashy lot covered with vacant buildings, but through community grants and a lot of hard work, it's now a two-thirds acre urban garden. Here, organizers also use the garden to teach youth about agriculture, part of an after-school program called Knowledge Quest. But the real star pupil here is this piece of land. It's amazing because the, you know, the whole neighborhood, there are still so many blighted properties, but this is really sort of that, um, sort of a beacon for tra uh, community transformation. These urban gardens will continue to produce food, flowers, and goodwill through the harvest season and beyond. Cities like Memphis can still maintain their agricultural roots, and where there's ground, something can grow. This is Charles Denny reporting. Well, finally today, we check in with the always enthusiastic Ranger Nick, who this month shows you how easy it is to build your very own ecosystem in the comforts of your own home. Well, the idea of farm to table is certainly getting more and more popular these days. And this month, I want to introduce you to the concept of tank to table. I want to talk about aquaponics. I'm hanging out at the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at the Fish Lab right here in Athens, Georgia. What we're looking at is the idea of hydroponics, the idea of growing plants without soil where they're just able to grow in that water. Now, you take that concept of hydroponics, marry that with this idea of aquaculture, growing the protein, growing that source of fish there as the fish are living and leaving behind all that lovely stuff that they leave behind those nitrates those nutrients go back into the water and feed the plants it's the concept of aquaponics and we're going to visit with an expert to talk about why in the world even care about a subject like this Dr. Jay Shelton is with me with the Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources at UGA and Dr. Shelton we've got a scaled down version of what we saw outside. Dr. Shelton, talk to us about what we're looking at and why somebody at home might care about aquaponics. Well, aquaponics is a form of 
gardening essentially, which allows us to provide a pr protein source as well as plants. So the beauty of it is that the fish provide the nutrients that the plants need, and the plants filter the water so that it can be returned to the fish tank. So it, it truly is a systems kind of approach here. Integrated approach, that's correct. Now, I see that some of the stuff has been conveniently labeled for us. Dr. Shelton, can you walk us through what some of these parts are and, and how they play together? Okay. Well, we need a grow bed, some sort of media, since we don't have any soil in this system, to uh, provide support for the plants. And we need to have some sort of life support, uh, some filtration, if you will, which is sort of a two-stage uh, system here where we do some biological filtering of the water and then we do some mechanical filtering to remove the waste and then we uh, need to have some sort of a culture unit to grow whatever types of aquatic organisms we want to use in the system and those are all connected in a closed loop so we're continuously recycling the same water. Interesting and it doesn't have to be tilapia that we're looking at here what else could we grow other kinds of fish? Oh, there's a variety of options. Tilapia is very popular, but other things that have been grown in these systems include catfish, any type of native fish that you might want to grow, but not just fish. People also grow crustaceans like hmm. crawfish uh, and shrimp in these systems. Interesting. And what I want to do next is go and talk about some of the benefits from a teaching standpoint that a system like this can provide. So let's check that out. Dr. Chris Irwin with the UGA Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources happens to be an environmental education expert. So let's say I'm a high school science teacher. Dr. Irwin, what in the world could I do and use to benefit my students in terms of aquaponics? Nick, there's a lot you can do. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are all part of what you can study with the aquaponics system, as well as you can in introduce technology with the students as well. Sensors are very good, real-time data collection, Data collection is then leads to synthesis of that information. You can also study social studies, language arts, expand that out, including electricity, uh, physics, Excellent. as well as uh, plumbing. Excellent. I can even envision writing a song about fish or something and performing that and sharing that in terms of language arts. The benefits of aquaponics really are deep and endless. You take a look around at some of the things we've shown you this month, it's pretty easy to do. Between $50 and up to several thousand dollars, you too can create one of these systems and benefit from the fresh veggies and the fish. Well, y'all, you know what to do. Go online and check out the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. While you're on there, check out the Aquaponic Facebook page. Slide on over to the Ranger Nick Facebook page and like that. I love it when you do it. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here again next month. See ya. Well, that is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor Show. Take care. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.